to have and to hold from this day forward for better for worse for richer for poorer in sickness and in health to love and to cherish till death do us part these are the ideal dreams to a newly wedded couple but what happens when the happily ever after becomes just another fairy tale Last week on This Is My Story, we started the love story of Moses and Hulda Kwagala, who confessed to have started their love journey on the wrong side of the bed. So I tell Hulda, um, and so what I did, and if you want to walk away, I would respect you, I understand. <laughs> I got a slap. <laughs> I don't know where the strength came from, but I slapped him good. And then afterwards I broke down. After that, they said, you have a choice to go. My life went from <laughs> holding hands in the street and cuddling up and things like that, because now everyone knows about us, we've introduced, to <sighs> depression in two weeks, dead. Clinical depression. She walked that aisle a wounded girl. The day I walked the aisle, it was so painful, like my own father never gave me away. One and a half years into marriage, Hulda could not enjoy the journey to motherhood as she was sinking into depression. Children are indeed a heritage and a reward from God. Soon, they welcomed their first bundle of joy. When they hand over your child and they cry, that's, I genuinely believe that's when it left. But if you ask me, when did, you, when did the depression leave? I don't know. But I remember holding my daughter and everything around me faded. And I was in love with this being that came from me. And from then, it drifted off. Like, I was like, no more again. Despite baby Joella bringing healing to their family, the joy was short-lived as the enemy of progress hit hard below the belt. I start work, and then I meet this guy at work who happened to be a manager that he recruited because he was in the top. He was a HR, um, a boss was a HR. So they, he worked at the head and then I had worked in the company so I was more like a support worker at that time. So the, I was a support worker and the guy I cheated with was um, a manager. And then um, he was an attractive guy, um, tall, of six feet something, light skinned, good looking. <laughs> and. Um, so yeah, things started spiring off and things like that and we got into a relationship, quite a very intense relationship. Because then now, my, remember, my feelings for my husband left when he broke me, so I was only trying to keep up with the rock. Now my baby comes in, I'm healed, I'm focused on my baby, there's no love for him that I'm giving him, right? So then this guy comes up and he showers me with things that we never did, like going out for like different places and you know, never didn't do all of that. So here we are, um, I get into this relationship, secret relationship, I had an affair. It is said that three can keep a secret if two of them are dead. Moses discovered the secret affair and decided to take the bull by the horns. He confronts me, exactly the same thing, I denied it. Now he flies out to South Africa, God shows him again exactly what's happened in the relationship. He tells me, calls me, I've seen this, I'm like, ah, oh, this all in your mind. First affair, mistake, forgive her. Second affair again, forgive her still. But the second one that lasted for 10 years, I uh, sorry, one year, I forgive her still. When I finally said, okay, he's caught me, <sighs> confronts me, calls my brother, my brother comes, having a meeting, now I'm ready to leave him, yeah? He then tells me, so my brother said to me, Huda, did you really do this thing? Did you, do, did you really ch cheat on your husband? This is me, yeah. Now you know how it feels. That's what I turn around and tell my husband. Now you know how it feels. That's exactly how I feel. How you feel is how I felt years ago. 
I struggled with it five years in our marriage. I'm still struggling to forgive him. I still struggle then to forgive him. And then I come, I chit. Relationship, he, he did a little bit, I did worse. Um, in a min, in, within that relationship, I fell pregnant. He sleeps with me the day he confronts me. Well, my husband sleeps with me the day he confronts me, but I had slept with the guy before that. So now I'm pregnant. I don't know who the father is. She didn't know the son was mine either. So she, they had to, we had, she, I remember she going back and forth. But of course, as a lady can give you her explanations as to why to validate is in my Now me, I'm seeing this uh, stomach beginning to grow and I'm trying to as daddy. You are the miracle worker. Arise by the power that made the heaven and earth transform that baby if it's for that man to be mine. I used to tell this in secret to God, God, you know me. There is no way I can stomach seeing this man walk through that door that he has come as a baby father to pick his child of all children. He's a boy. You know what that means to a man? Picking a boy from my home. That, that is his boy. I said, that, this diffuses everything. I kind of knew, you know when you kind of know, but you kind of miss count the dates and then you go back and forth. I was getting hospital. I was like, let's, 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 go back. let's count this. I was counting day and night. <laughs> Soon, a son was born and the truth was revealed in broad daylight. I push out the child. Moses was cold. They even asked him to come and cut the cord. Refused. Only because he scared of blood, but in a woman's eyes, it's almost like rejection. So now I'm thinking my husband's rejected to cut his own son's cord, but which I don't even know if it's a son, right? And then, and then there is me at the same time looking at my son, and he wouldn't even like hold him or anything like that. And I said to him, I remember saying to him, push my son towards me. Yeah, because I was on the bed, I couldn't move properly. And then he pushed him like this, and I looked at this son, I put my son, I carried him, I put him on my breast, and he, he ate, yeah? And then I, I examined him. When I examined him, <laughs> when I examined him, I knew it was his. Because you know when you're with your husband, you exa I don't know about other women, but I examined my husband from back to front, head to toe, when he's naked. So when my son was born, I looked at him from head to toe, even the little bits that he doesn't know that he's got. I was like, that's his son. I'm not going to say nothing. I was a pastor and in depression. As I said, no, I can't deceive these people. I handed over the church to my sons in the Lord at the time to manage the church because I felt I didn't have much to give at that time. Felt like I didn't want, um, and I felt the transition to leave London and go outside of London to focus on building my family and start ministry outside of London. <laughs> it is out there. Still, my wife would tell me, let us speak to your spiritual parents. We need to speak to our spiritual parents because now I'd, be, I'd began to become angry. Every small thing would be annoying me. And she would say something and it annoys me. I'll slam the door and walk away and never raise a hand. But I'll slam the door and go away on a few occasions. I remember one time I smashed a tray on the ground, but that was another thing. The tray was, <laughs> and it broke in pieces. This is pasta, you know. Eh? Life wasn't getting any easier, even with the birth of the second bundle of joy. Every passing day became like a ticking time bomb. And one day, a mistake pulled the trigger, breaking all hell loose. I went straight to food shopping. I asked him to come downstairs to help me. And it took, I don't know if the bell didn't ring or the keys, I don't know what was wrong with it. It took a bit longer. I got the things in, I was so upset. And then I put on this, I was a very provocative woman, by the way. So I would put on this thing and I was like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and then he would tell me, where have you been? And then I'll be like, where do you think, where have I been? Like, it, there was a lot of like, you know, like, don't tell me that, just, 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 and I said, don't accuse me. When are you ever going to forgive me? Da, 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 don't accuse me. And I said, see, you started coming back late. Hmm? You, how have you facilitated for my healing now? That's been a year now. That was just a year and one month. How have you facilitated for my healing? 
he got so much heated up. And then we had a dining table. He got the chair <laughs> and he went, stop talking to me like that. And then he went, I don't even know if this child is mine. And to me, I was like, I was looking to go for a very long time. I just didn't know how to go. Oh my God, that's what, that's what she was waiting for, an escape route. Moment that word was mentioned, she picked up the phone loud. <laughs> Put the phone that I think was is it the dad or the brother? She called. <laughs> are you are you safe? Have you been touched? Oh, she wailed like I'd slapped her. Anu, just come and pick me up. I'm so dramatic as well. Anu, just come and pick me up. I'm not enough. I can't do this anymore. And I remember my brother had told me, give the man a DNA. And I said, oh, I'm happy to give him a DNA if he asks for it. If he doesn't ask for it, that's fine. But I know it's his, ch his child, but don't you think he deserves to know who's the father? This is me. Yeah, that's fine. But when he asks for it. So I never envisioned, envisioned that he would ask for it that way. So for me, when he did that, I was like, oh, you just rejected your own son. Ticket for me to leave. So I picked up a phone, called my brother. Then my dad came that night. Dad, my dad sat down for over the whole night. That time he came roughly around nine-ish. It was a hard truth. My, my, my father-in-law told me, look at you. A man who would speak, a man who you would, I looked up to you as my, I'm your father, but I looked up to you as my spiritual father. You're the one that led me to Christ. That's my father-in-law telling me. And I discovered, hey, I need to put my, I need to put myself together. Hulda breathed a sigh of relief when her mother picked her from her matrimonial home early the next morning. I packed only two suitcases in the entire house. I packed my clothes, I packed my kids' clothes, and my kids' documents and my documents. She left with the kids. I was left alone. I came back to the empty house, no noise. I couldn't hear no child crying, no one. Daddy, daddy, welcome. No, I'm there seated. So what I did down, this is set and has a setup. Down the house, we had a, you know, English fish and, ch fish and chips shop and KFC kind of chicken. I would come back from work, not even taking off the ties and the suit, just go to that. I order plenty, sit in, in my living room with remote. Channel after channel, eating chips and chicken. I ate myself. I grew chicks. I had 120 kgs eating myself to the grave in depression. I would sleep there from work. TV is watching me. <laughs> Until 5 a.m., my alarm wakes me up. Why? To go to the shower. Shower, get into a car, go to work. So that was my routine. Moses was clothed with shame and his reputation was at stake. A role model to many and a spiritual father to a congregation, how did Moses deal with the embarrassment of his wife walking out? Be sure to find out after this short break. FamilyNews.today provides an escape room from the clutter through our podcasts from church escapades. We get disappointed with God, and I think it's a, it's a misplaced anger. To daily devotionals. The beauty about God's love is that it was focused on all that God had. To financial and life tips, bedtime stories for your child, all these and much more available just for you on FamilyNews.today, on Spotify, Google Podcast, and SoundCloud. Insight at your fingertips. All of us get broken in some way. But what really matters is how we get back up and put the pieces back together. As the world was caving in on Moses, he thought of rekindling his love life on a dating site. Pastor put up his picture. I looked for the ones when I'm physically, you know, fit. Not the one when I'm, when I'm chubby with the chubby stomach. <laughs> and then I put my profile, uh, athletic body type, um, muscly, ah, all that kind of stuff. Physically fit, visiting the gym. Which gym was I visiting? I got interests 
Eight ladies were interested in me. Now I d decided, okay, I picked out of those from different cities. I said, I'm going to go Bolton, Manchester, Liverpool. I'm not going to do so much London. Let me go outside London. I'm so much known here in London. Let me go do my business. Uh -huh. Bolton, I, I remember I picked a lady from Liverpool, Manchester, Manchester. I picked one from Bolton. And there's another one I can't remember where it was. Eight of them, I wrote them down, the numbers. And now this is what I was going to do. Every Friday, when I break off work, I got on the train, go meet the woman like that. Now, the week I was meant to do the first one. Now, guess what? <laughs> I looked for my list. I couldn't find it. I checked my iPad to remember the website. I speak this before the living God. Even today, I can't remember what is the name of the website where I registered myself until today. Probably my picture is even there. I don't know. It, he erased it. I looked. You know, on the iPad, you can look. The traces, the history of the website, none. And I had created a different email for it. Which email also I forgot. Freedom indeed. Hulda entered through the wide gate and embarked on the broad road to self-destruction. I started clubbing, drinking. I was like, oh, this is the high life I've been missing when I was married. <laughs> you know what I mean? Married to a priest, you can't drink, you can't, you know? So when I tested, then it, come, it comes then to beg for me. And I was like, no. I was like, no. No, I'm not coming back. And then when he came to beg for me again, then he went and then he came back. When he came back to beg for me the second time, that's when he went, can I have a DNA? And then my mom said, if I was you, if I give him a DNA and I know that's his child, I would not let him see his kids and punish him. Yeah. So I was like, yeah. <laughs> me too, I said, yeah. So anyway, we gave him a DNA and the DNA came back. 99.99.99.999% so the one was mine so it's like their father and I think I could only imagine the relief on him you know and from when he received the DNA when he would come back to he would come to pick up his kids to see them like on the weekend I could see a difference that he is now embraced that that's his son it was a somehow happy but broken so I'll finish work and go back to pie I would drink Monday to Thursday, we have a little break, then go back Monday to Monday. I hit every club, name it. In London, I was literally known in every club. I had friends, different friends, Nigerians, everywhere. I just, just, I was drinking. I was smoking weed. Sometimes when my kids are away, I'll do it in the house. I'll just smoke and just drink and smoke all day. The high and fast life only offered Hulda a temporary relief while her children suffered the collateral damage. My children suffered what we call child depression. I didn't know about that. They changed, my son changed into a monster, I became really aggressive and angry. My daughter became withdrawn, um, broke down so many times, and I mean serious breakdowns. Um, then I resulted into alcohol, a um, bit of drug abuse, which is um, weed, so I smoked weed almost day and night. Then I realized that my children had not grieved their father leaving. So my children's grades deteriorated. They went all the way down to almost like bottom class. My boy was aggressive. I didn't know that these were all traits of like, you know, like brokenness, like, you know, um, until I did my dissertation. I actually made sure that my dissertation is linked into understanding how children, so the question was, what are the effects of separation and divorce on children's social and emotional development? I chose to do that question for my dissertation and write a book about it because I needed help. I was so much enclosed in my own pain that I forgot they're grieving, they're also in pain. That was a wake up call for Mama Bear to brood over her children like a mother hen. I started to love them again. I forgot my pain. I thought I had to put aside everything I was going through and put all my entire being, my focus on helping them to heal. I started loving them again because at that time I was shouting, oh my God, I beat my girl. She even sometimes remembers. She said, Mama, I used to think, you know, do you want to love me? But I said, Joel, I loved you to my bone. I just didn't know how I was. I was so 
enveloped in my pain that I forgot you were hurting. I'm really sorry. It took us a whole year of talking, talking to Joella, talking to Ray about how I behaved, about how I neglected their pain. It's almost like I had to go let them go through that grieving process and I cancelled them through because of that dissertation that I had done. And after that, when I started to love them again, I even, because at that time I was so stubborn that I cut contact with their dad. I said, okay, this guy, when he comes to pick them up, he leaves them with the kid, he leaves me with the kids, and then I'm left to pick up the pieces. My, it takes my daughter a whole week to settle down that her dad's gone. So every time, so for example, she comes and picks them up on the weekend or he flies from Kenya and comes and gets them. I'm like, okay, you can have your children for two weeks, fine. When he brings them back, it will take me two to three weeks just to get them to say, it's okay. It was so hard, I even prayed about it. I said, God, right, I'm, I know I'm sinful. I'm drinking, I'm smoking, and I'm having relationships. I'm sleeping with guys, right? And, um, and I said, but I need your help. I need your help. Don't do it for me. Do it for my children, because they're innocent in this. Between a rock and a hard place, Hulda looked up to the mountains where her help could come from. God is faithful. He just puts somebody there that has been, been through the same situation. Because listen to me, listen to me. Where's the woman in you? Mama bear, where is it? You're good to fight. You have to fight for your children. You're not doing this for you. You're doing this for your children so you can get a, you know, a good job and bring food and you know, being able to provide for your children, traveling, this and that. And I was like, okay, I fought through it by the grace of God. And I graduated. Years passed pretty fast as the gap between Moses and Hulda deepened. Moses gave up a well-paying job and heeded to a call to start a ministry in Kenya. May, May 24th in 2014, God meets me, sells me, tells me, um, raise me a generation of a people of fire. And then he began talking to me about Kenya. And then I ended up obeying, leaving Europe and resigning my job to come here when I really didn't know nobody here. Hulda, on the other hand, was trying hard every day to put her life back into perspective. I would even tell my kids, pray that God gives you a good stepdad, you know, and pray that God gives your dad a good stepmom that will love you as his own and pray that, you know, God will give me a good stepdad that will love you as his own, you know, children. And I was serious. Get up every morning, pray. Every evening, pray. So we prayed, yeah. And I even, I used to say to God, God, Let's just be serious. I have needs. I have physical needs. I, you know, I, I'm a young girl. I need to be, you know, like sexually. But you, God, you're God. You can't fulfill that. I would ha get into a conversation with God. Like, you know how you sit there goes, no. I would say, God, let's talk. Seriously, you cannot fulfill that need. I know you are God, but that part, you can't fulfill it. You need to give me somebody. Otherwise, I don't know what to do anymore. I don't want to be, you know, in different relationships. And nothing, he didn't say nothing. Little did she know that God was listening. One day, as she was about her usual routine in the house, she noticed something unusual in her breast. I went to the doctor and the doctor said, OK, we're just going to take some blood tests and then we'll give you a call. If there's nothing to worry about, we won't get you on here from us. But if there's something to worry about, then, you know. And then the doctor tells me, right, I, I take the blood test, the next day, they came back in the afternoon, I was at work, and the doctor called me and said, oh hi, this is um, the Clovis um, Health Centre, can you please um, come immediately? <laughs> I, said, I said, okay, right, okay, thanks very much, bye. I dropped everything, I, w I was working in a school then, I dropped everything, and said, I need to go to the doctors, they've just called me, they need me to go. <sighs> That was the longest journey, so I took, in fact, I took a bus and I went to the GP and I sat down. I came, I fingered myself in. They didn't call my name until I was the last person that were closing. They've seen everybody, even the ones that are coming in late, they've seen them. I was the last person and they're seated. My legs are shaking, everything is shaking, and the doctor calls me, come in. And he's like, did you bring anyone with you? <laughs> I said, right. Okay, um, no, a bit bold. And then he said, okay, so you took blood test yesterday, I said yeah, um, and the blood results came back and said yes. Um, okay, you have hyperlactrin in your blood. I said, 
What is that? The diagnosis blew up her mind, crushing her spirit. So I said, you know what? There must be a reason why I'm going through this. So I started to pray. I said, God, let me introduce myself. <laughs> oh Lord, my name is Huda. That God doesn't know me. <laughs> oh Lord. <sighs> so I laid an altar because I was listening to Miles Monroe and I laid prostrate before God and said, Lord, talk to me. There must be a reason why you're doing this. Why are you talking to me? What are you telling me? God didn't speak. Second time, because God wants to see consistency. One morning, I was in the kitchen, pacing up and down, I had just cleaned, trying to stay focused. And the voice told me, call Moses. I went, hey! Okay. I pasted up and down. I haven't spoken to him for like, like normally he would say, hello, and I'll go to the kids, talk to your dad. I wouldn't talk to him. So I had not had a conversation with him. Now God's telling me to call him. And now my ego, because <laughs> I had just sent him a divorce. And I don't want to know, and I'm telling him I'm getting married, and all of a sudden, now I'm calling him. Okay, I'm saying, God, okay, I'm calling him. Now, in my mind, I'm thinking God is asking me to call him to hand over his children. Now he's preparing me to die, you know? I, <laughs> I pick up the call. <laughs> I call him, I was like, crap, Moses, um, <clears throat> you're right. Yeah, yeah, so basically, um, I need you to prepare, basically, I've been told that, um, I've been told that um, uh, um, I have tumors on my brain, and um, I'm going to, um, yeah, I don't know what's gonna happen, so I have tumors on my brain, and I need to prepare, basically, you need to come back and look after your children, you know, giving up with life. And it's his response that that's what where God started fully from. He said, <laughs> nobody connected to me just dies. Nobody. Moses quickly arranged for his travels and a few days later he left Kenya for the United Kingdom. So when he comes now, he's coming to my house for the first time. Woo! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Hello, we're all standing looking at each other. <laughs> I'm going, hello. Hello, I remember him giving me a handshake. <laughs> I'm going, hello. And then, and then I was like, hi. So I remember my, my house was like, had seats there, had seats there. He sits there. I sit like this. Yeah, curled up. I'm looking at him, shaking, shaking inside you know when you're like like your anxiety i'm looking at this guy he's looking at me he's like hi kid hi children <laughs> how are you doing <laughs> we're looking at each other <sighs> and then i remember he just i think at that time he just went straight into the bible and i was just desperate anything to get me healed proverbs chapter 19 verse 21 tells us that Many are the plans of a man, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. A few months later, Moses and Hulda confessed their sins one to another, forgave each other, and eventually renewed their vows. And Matthew 19, 6 became their testimony. In fact, I've never been in love, but I am not, I could say I am deeply in love with my husband. Absolutely. Like, I never knew that this would happen. The power that transforms people is your testimony. If Moses can go, can fall into a sin of fornication, and Moses come out, I can come out. 2nd of August 2019 will forever be inscribed in their hearts. The day marked the end of a six years separation and divorce, a day they proved to the world that for sure, there are no irreconcilable differences. It's been four years of pure bliss, forgiveness, love, and reaching out to young couples and to the lost, while sharing of the goodness of the Lord. If you have a story you would like to share with us, kindly text us on 20316 or WhatsApp on 0786 316 316 and we will get back to you.